When does life begin? What do we do when legislation and court decisions aim to define this? Over the last few years, we've seen a ton of legislation and court cases related to abortion. This year, we're obviously not seeing a change in this, especially with the recent Alabama Supreme Court decision around IVF. With this decision, a lot of people are asking that if an embryo is recognized as a child under the law, does that mean you can claim it as a dependent on your tax return? Does this impact deportation of a pregnant person? Um, does this mean that this is when child support payments start? All of these types of questions are raised almost immediately when we see legislation and decisions that try to define when life begins. So this week, I thought it'd be a good time to revisit a blog from last year, the Georgia Pro-Birth Accountability Act proposed by Georgia Representative Kendrick after the Life Act was made law. So let's have a brief overview of what this bill is related to, because it actually has nothing to do with IVF and is about six-week abortion bans. Leading up to the overturn of Roe v. Wade, we saw a lot of states propose and pass six-week abortion bans. This six-week mark is a common trend in abortion legislation, as it's believed to be when medical professionals can detect cardiac activity, simplified by many as a heartbeat. Many doctors say that what is defined as this activity is usually just sporadic electrical impulses that then after more time coordinate into rhythmic pulses that we can recognize as a heartbeat. Another issue people have with six-week bans is how this time period is calculated. Because of the way that pregnancy is measured, people are pre-pregnant for two weeks every month until their egg is either fertilized or they have a period. So in reality, these bans give pregnant people just one or two weeks to realistically find out if they're pregnant and make a decision. Years ago, we took a closer look at abortion trigger laws, which were these six week bans that were put on the book but weren't enforceable because Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. In 2019, Brian Kemp signed the Life Act into law, which prohibited abortion after six weeks of pregnancy, allowed some exceptions if the woman was facing serious harm or death in pregnancy, and also allowed for some exceptions in cases of rape and incest, but only as long as a police report was filed. The Living Infants Fairness and Equality Act also expanded the definition of what a natural person was within the state to include an unborn child with a detectable human heartbeat. Like we said, this bill didn't immediately go into effect because Roe was still the law of the land. And it also spent from 2019 to 2022 in court while we all waited for this decision on Roe. When Roe was overturned, the Life Act went into effect, but it went right back to court. On November 15th, 2022, the Superior Court of Fulton County found that the Life Act violated Georgia's constitutional right to liberty, privacy, and or equal protection. But just one week later on the 23rd, the Georgia Supreme Court issued an injunction against the lower court's decision that made the Life Act unenforceable, which then reinstated the prohibitions on abortion in Georgia. So the Life Act is currently the law in Georgia and the six week abortion ban is in effect. What is the Pro-Birth Accountability Act? So this bill would make the state of Georgia financially responsible for all pregnancies in which abortion care was desired but unattainable because of the Life Act. The bill states to obtain compensation from the state, a woman shall file an affidavit with the Department of Human Services indicating but for the law prohibiting an abortion upon a detectable heartbeat of an embryo or fetus, she would have chosen to terminate the pregnancy and not given birth. Under the law, pregnant people would be compensated by the state on medical care during and after their pregnancy and be eligible for any child-related state or federal income tax credits and assistance programs like SNAP. The bill also requires that the state pay for burial expenses if a pregnant person dies in childbirth or provide support if they get a disability um, as a result of the pregnancy. The bill also outlines postpartum expenses to be covered by the state, including health, dental, and vision care until the child's 18. And finally, the state would have to create a savings trust to support qualified higher education. South Carolina introduced a similar bill in 2023 and this year, but unlike the Georgia bill, it requires a lawsuit to be filed for someone to receive compensation. Although the bill didn't receive a hearing in the Republican controlled state house and Senate, Kendrick said this is an incredibly serious bill. She's quoted saying, this is an actual bill, a serious bill. I don't understand why every conservative hasn't ran to sign it. 
If you claim to be pro-life and pro-family, I'm giving you exactly what you're asking for, which is to support our families and support our unborn children. I find legislation like this to be incredibly interesting and thought-provoking. There definitely needs to be conversation around what support needs to be put in place for people who are forced to give birth or for people who are having how they give birth really influenced by the government. This conversation about what implications the Alabama IVF decision has on this show that these questions aren't just around abortion bans. So what do you think about this? Is it too far? Not far enough? Should we be looking at this at a federal level? What's next?